Houston and Discovery. Discovery Houston, go ahead, Brew. Uh, thanks, Sam. Well, we're just getting a little calm reconfigured here, and uh, good to hear you loud and clear. Uh, we are on base. The uh, post home two procedures are ready to move over to post insertion if you're uh, formally into the post insertion checklist, if you're ready. This is Mission Control Houston. Next on NASA television will be the post-launch news conference. Before that uh, originates from the Kennedy Space Center, we have an audio clip to replay from the International Space Station where Commander Mike Fink of the Expedition 18 crew made some comments just following launch as he and his crewmates were able to watch uh, Discovery's launch. And uh, we do have video we're preparing of that crew watching the launch that will replay uh, following the news conference. But here is the audio from Fink following Discovery's launch. Houston, this is International Space Station, Space to Ground 1. And go ahead, Mike. Yeah, on behalf of the Expedition 18 crew on the beautiful International Space Station, we would like to uh, really congratulate our shuttle team for a flawless, beautiful launch uh, that we saw up here. It was amazing, and uh, it didn't happen by magic. A lot of people uh, worked really hard to get Discovery ready, and we waited for the right time, and uh, boy, it was beautiful, and you could tell on board that we were very excited. Congratulations to the team that goes to Discovery. Thank you, Mike. Copy all that, and it was a beautiful launch, although we're kind of wondering why Sandy wasn't a little more excited. We were just a little wondering about that. Well, you know, Sandy, uh, when it comes down to here, she's very calm, cool, and collected. <laughs> uh, we're, we're very excited, and uh, we'll download the, uh, the uh, uh, high-def uh, video whenever you guys are set up for us. Okay, we'll let you know whenever we're ready to receive that, and uh, really glad you guys got to watch the launch. It certainly looked beautiful from here, and it looked beautiful watching you guys watching it from up there. And uh, special thanks uh, to the BMEs for pulling that out uh, at the last minute to be able to get us uh, to watch. We were, we were wondering there if we were just going to have to listen to, listen to the launch, but uh, we were happy, to, very happy to see it. Yeah, thanks, guys. That was really nice to be able to watch it. We really appreciate it. And BME says, uh, you're very welcome. They were very happy to support. Good evening and welcome to the STS-119 post-launch news conference. We're pleased this evening to be joined by NASA's Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Mr. Bill Gerstenmeier, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency Vice President, Yukihide Hayashi, Mission Management Chairman Mike Moses, and Shuttle Launch Director Mike Leinbach. Good evening. We will begin with opening comments and then take your questions. Mr. Gerstenmeier. Thanks, Mike. It's great to be here. Um, I think when we work a little extra hard to, to get to the launch, I think it's even a little sweeter when the launch actually occurs. And, and, and this worked out just really wonderful. 
I, I can't thank enough the teams that, that worked so hard to get us here, the flow control valve team that, that worked uh, many, many days to, to get ready and clear the flow control valve issue. That was a true team effort throughout NASA. We did work at Stennis and at, at the Glenn Research Center, at Marshall, at, at Ames. Uh, it was just the entire team pulled together to work that issue and get it resolved, and that was just a phenomenal effort. And then I can't say enough about the great uh, team down here at KSC that took the the uh, GSC umbilical carrier plate activity and the hydrogen leak that occurred there, and they were able to work that and, and work over the, the past couple days to get that equipment back. They had a lot of critical work that needed to be done. It wasn't easy work, but they just did a phenomenal job, and I really want to thank them. I also want to thank the range folks that, that helped us with the range, that made sure that we could get a launch, uh, a place to go fly. I know the the, uh, the WGS folks wanted to go fly as well, and, and they were very gracious to let us get on the range and go ahead and fly. So, again, a tremendous team effort, tremendous work for folks. Uh, I can never say enough about these launches. This launch was really special. If you saw it and you saw the clouds and you saw the SRB separations, I don't think I've seen a launch that, that was as pretty as this one. So each one continues to amaze me. It continues to amaze me how strong the team is, how much they work together, how much they're dedicated, and what precision. And when that precision all comes to work and we have a flawless launch like this, it's just fantastic. So thanks. I'm very happy to witness this successful launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, on which JAXA's astronaut Koichi Wakata boarded. Uh, Mr. Koichi Wakata is on the board as a mission specialist this time, and uh, he will replace astronaut Sandra Magnus. This mission marks the Japanese first resident ISS astronaut mission. And during his stay, he is going to perform full-scale space experiments in Gem Kibo. This mission is a giant leap for the Japanese manned space activity program. It will accumulate variable, uh, varia variable knowledge and experience for the future Japanese space utilization program. The keyboard's overboard experiment platform and the overboard uh, pallet will be launched soon. I'd like to express my heartful, heart, heartfelt gratitude to those who supported astronaut Wakata, both in Japan and the United States, especially to the NASA staff. And I sincerely hope your uh, continued support to the Japanese space program. Thank you. Well, let's see, folks, good evening. It's, uh, it's a whole lot sweeter being here today talking to you than it was a few days ago when we were talking scrub turnaround options. Uh, we, we came to do what we needed to do tonight, and it, it went off perfectly. Um, Mr. Gersmeyer kind of summed it up pretty good. I can't really say it too much better how fantastic the team worked. You know, this started back uh, last fall when uh, we decided to, to put off the Hubble mission for a little while while we worked some issues with the Space Telescope, and the 119 team suddenly found themselves as the prime uh, team down here and the prime crew back in Houston got themselves trained and ready to go. We had some hiccups last month with flow control valves over this last week with the, uh, the GUP on the, the ET vent line, uh, but it all came together for us tonight, uh, just the way we like to see it. Um, it was really a, a very smooth launch countdown. We had uh, a couple little issues. I'll let Mike tell you the details, but as a mission management team, there were really nothing of any significance. They were uh, very easy uh, things to approve with the paperwork process, basically documenting what we do if, uh, if the next failure happened. Um, so everything was good. I um, want to give a special thanks to the uh, RSRM team, the Reusable Solid Rocket Motor team. This was their 100th launch since that redesign that happened after Challenger. Uh, so it's uh, commendable that they've, uh, they've built a system that's working fantastic and has been almost perfect since that day. So congratulations to that whole team. Um, we got the latest report from Orbit. OMS 2 is finished up. Um, everything's looking really good on the, on the orbiter. Uh, and the crew's getting ready to configure from the, uh, the, the rocket for ascent to the spaceship for orbit. And, and get ready to head up to the space station. So we're looking forward to them getting started with their mission. It's a very packed mission, um, you know, installing the S6 truss, getting the, uh, the water distillation assembly on the station back up and running, uh, prepping for STS-127, the 2JA mission uh, with JAXA. Uh, all those things have to happen, and so uh, the first part's down, but we've got to focus on what's in front of us, too, and look ahead, uh, looking forward to a really good mission on orbit. Um, that's all I had, Mike. Okay, thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Well, the countdown really was pretty smooth. We had a couple issues we worked, uh, but really never never constrained to T0. Um, but the thing I'd really like to, to mention tonight is for the folks who watch this launch on TV, I really wish you could have been here in Florida. Um, I've seen a lot of launches, either 
as a test director or the launch director, and this was the most visually beautiful launch I have ever seen. It was just spectacular. Um, when the orbiter and the, and the tank and boosters got up, in, up into the sunlight that had just set about 10 minutes prior, it was just gorgeous. And in separation, you could see the boosters um, coming back down to Earth, and, and we could see the orbiter from the firing room seven minutes into flight, and at that point in time, it, the orbiter somewhere off the New Jersey and um, New York coast. Um, just a spectacular night. Um, really, really proud of the team who pulled together over the last few days to, to fix the, the hydrogen leak on the side of the orbiter on the ground support equipment. That worked just exactly as we had anticipated. The leakage there tonight was zero. Outstanding job. And then of course, then the flow control valve over the last four or five weeks have just been outstanding, and they got the, they got the flow award tonight after launch. Um, hundreds of people worked on that, on that issue, and, and they deserve the award, and they, and they got it tonight. So the countdown was, was smooth. Um, we were all rewarded with a beautiful, beautiful launch, and I'm just very proud to be part of this team. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will take questions first here in Kennedy and then uh, go to the Johnson Space Center. Please wait for the microphone, state your name and affiliation, and to whom your question is addressed. We'll start with Mike Schneider. Yeah, Mike Schneider, Associated Press. Question for Mike Longbach. If you could uh, just tell us how the uh, fluid control valves worked. Is there any indication that there was any kind of malfunction? malfunction? Uh, I didn't see any in the count. Did you see any? Going no. We, they, uh, I talked to the flight director console before I came over here. They watched the data, reviewed it. Uh, everything looked, looked spot on with the pressure traces during ascent. In the back here. Uh, Pat Duggins, WMFE and National Public Radio for Mr. Gersten Meyer. Uh, since one set of the solar arrays was in the box for five years, the other for eight years, uh, any concern about possible sticks as we start to extend them or anything differently for this deploy compared to others? Again, we've had the luxury of, of learning and watching the other deploys, so the, the crews have a very detailed procedure on what to watch. Um, as they deploy, they've got some nice step and hold posi positions they can do. They've got some thermal conditioning they can go do. So we're prepared in case anything happens. We, we look at the data and we look at the way we stored them and we think they should be okay. We didn't store them with pressure on them. We don't think they should stick, but we're prepared in case they do and we've got the right procedures to go ahead and make sure that we can deploy them in a slow manner if we need to when it comes time to go deploy them. So we're ready to go get the solar arrays deployed and, and bring the space station up to full power. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today, I guess for Mike Leinbach. Um, do you know what happened to the bat? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we had a bat that was uh, on the side of the external tank. He, he was on the, the north and west side of the tank, which is the good side. It's away from the orbiter. Um, we we uh, characterize him as unexpected debris, and uh, he's probably still unexpected debris somewhere. Mark? Uh, thanks. Uh, Mark Carreau from the Houston Chronicle. Uh, can you say anything about any obvious debris issues that you'd be following this soon, or is that to come? Thanks. Seems like I think you looked. Yeah, I went back and, and tried to find the team, and they had already disappeared. So then they had somebody go, uh, go look for them, and we didn't see anything in the video. So uh, we'll continue to look. They'll continue to pour over the data over the next couple, uh, a couple days. But at uh, first look, it, it looked pretty clean. So. Um, I didn't. I watched the video in real time. I didn't see anything in real time, and then we went and looked at the first quick look, and we didn't see anything at all in the first quick look. But again, some of the lighting conditions weren't optimum. It'll take a little bit of time for the teams to go look, and, and we'll see what we get when, when we get some more detailed reviews. But it looked very good. Vic, Vic Ratner from ABC News. Did the crew report any debris going by or any debris hits? Let's see. Uh, you know. Uh, Ohms 2 was just finishing up as we got here, so that's a little early. Uh, we asked for the crew debris report after that, uh, once they get a little more stable on orbit, so a little early for that report. In the front row, Craig. Yeah, thank you. It's uh, Craig Cavalt with Spaceflight Now. Uh, Bill, the, the performance of the vehicle and the team this week speaks for itself, but for a, for a Washington guy, um, the president last week said there's a sense that NASA is adrift. Do you agree that NASA is adrift? Um, no. I, I think we're, we're pretty focused here on what we're doing. Uh, we know exactly what we got to do to get the space station up and operational. 
We've got a good research plan. We're working very closely with our international partners. We're moving forward with those objectives. We're making very good progress on the Constellation hardware, as you can see, over in High Bay 4 of the VAB. So, so I think we're, we're moving in a, in a good direction. I think we can do a better job of communicating what we're doing with folks on the outside and let them know what we're doing. Um, I think it's also up to all of us to, to explain a little bit what it takes to really go fly this vehicle. And it's not just this vehicle. I think it's any vehicle that goes to space requires a lot of attention to detail. You know, the, the flow control valve that we had a problem with, all vehicles will have some type of device to pressurize the tank. How that device is designed and how it works, it's got to be state of the art and has to really perform well. The, the umbilical carrier panel that we had trouble with, that same thing will sit on other vehicles that sat on the Saturn vehicle as well in a similar design. So that the fact that our teams can work and be focused and resolve those problems, but yet still keep the big picture in, in play and make sure that we can figure out how to go get the mission accomplished is a huge plus for this team. And, and in that sense, I don't consider us being adrift. We're, we're very focused. We know what we need to go do. We were able to, to remove an EVA from this flight to get back to three EVAs to get the work that needed to be done to continue steady progress towards where we are to get space station to a, a state where it can be more full, fully utilized and we can increase the crew size to six. Greg? Uh, Greg Dobbs, congratulations, uh, from HDNet Television. I'd like to look forward about a year and a half to go, as things now stand before the fleet is retired, eight more missions on the schedule, maybe nine. Uh, if you're going to keep that schedule, you've got to operate at a pace faster than you've been able to do in the last year or two or maybe even a little more. Can you do it? I'll ask. I'm not sure who it's for. Maybe Bill, maybe Mike Lineback, maybe both of you. I don't know. Kind of our, our answer is that we're going to take each one of these flights one at a time and focus on that next flight and then just continue to work it out and see how it see how it comes across as we move forward so i don't think it's out of the realm of possibility but we're not going to do something dumb and push something and work too fast or push too hard so we'll take the right steady pace and just keep moving forward with one flight at a time and, and mike i don't know if you want to well from a processing perspective you know our guys love to work on the orbiters and and uh, we wish we had more flights than we do frankly but we are where we are we're going to process and launch these and and like we said before, as long as they stay at a relatively good spacing, we should be able to make those with no problem at all. May I ask to follow, what is the consequence if you don't, the consequence to the uh, build out of the space station, amongst other things? Well, again, we've kind of ordered the flights in, in a manner that if we have to drop a flight off the end, we can drop it off. Uh, the idea was we wanted to populate the space station with a lot of spares towards the end, so it could could essentially operate without the shuttle being around until the commercial orbital uh, commercial resupply services contracts come in place and until CEV gets flying. So we wanted to have station fully populated with spares to be in a more robust posture. If for some reason we can't achieve that and we have to drop a flight off, we'll leave space station a less than desired posture, but it still should be still be use, usable. It still should be able to meet its research objectives. So, so again, there's not a, you know, in our world, there's not a really a, it's okay, it's not okay kind of line. It just gets a little bit tougher. And we really want to get all those flights, but if we don't, we'll figure out a way to deal with them and we'll be prepared. Ada? Adam on Segundivision. Um, the mission has been shortened, but uh, which of the original mission objectives will then have, uh, will not be accomplished at all? Let's see. Um you know the, the the major mission objectives are going to be accomplished. We we list them out in a in a priority table. Um, I don't know exactly which ones are dropping off. I think um, when you look at it, um, we're at the probably the 80 90 percent mark. So almost all the significant objectives are being accomplished. So I can't answer specifically which ones are dropping. Bill, I don't know if you know specifically. Yeah. We had a couple EVA tasks. Some of the um, payload uh, accommodation sites on the truss. We were going to go ahead and deploy. Um, those were for they were needed for ULF three, which is a flight which is uh, three flights away, four flights, four flights away. away. So there's plenty of time for us to pick them up during a stage or pick them up during one of the other flights that are there. So so as Mike said, all the critical activities, the solar array deploy, the urine processor distiller assembly that will get done, uh, the uh, 
portable water distribution bus activity that will be done the solar array deploy will be done so all the major things will that are needed will be completed and all the tasks that need to be done prior to the 2JA flight in May or, excuse me in June all those tasks will be complete so these are tasks that were in a sense get ahead that can be accommodated in one of the next two three or four flights down the road so again it's not a major setback to us we're able to accomplish everything we want uh, on this flight Curtis Kruger, St. Petersburg Times, for Mr. Gersten Meyer or anybody else who'd like to jump in. Uh, on the, the valve issue, it seemed to be kind of a slow and deliberate process of study, uh, willingness to adjust the launch schedule. And I, I wonder, would that have gone the same way pre-Columbia? Were we maybe seeing the result of some of the post-Columbia reforms and the willingness to take maybe a slower pacing with this? Boy, it, it I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, you, you know, I w we kind of work the data that's given us, and, and when we see the data and we see something we don't like, we need to resolve it to the extent that we need to get it resolved before we can go fly. So it, it's tough to say if it's a, a pre- or post-Columbia thing. I, I think we always address those problems that we knew were problems with the same rigor. It's, it's when we, we get surprised by something that we collectively don't think is a problem, and, and then it, it turns out to be a much bigger deal to us like Columbia. That's when we get into trouble. So the, so the thing that we need to do as a team is we need to stay hungry and, and keep thinking about things and kind of what if them and, and understand and look for other areas. You know, frankly, I worry a little bit when we work something like the flow control valve because we're so focused on the flow control valve that we're not worried about all the other things and what other stuff could be out there that we might miss. So we got to be careful that we don't get so myopic and focus on that one individual item that we're not looking at the overall system and continuing to look at data. So, so what I encourage our team to do is to just continue to look and to ask questions. If a tech's assembling something and it doesn't go together exactly right, he should ask about it. We ought to talk about it. The same thing with an engineer. If you run an analysis and you see something that doesn't look exactly right, ask about it. We can take time and learn and we can discover. You know, we still continue to learn about this vehicle as many years as we've flown it. And, and we stay healthy flying and we stay safe flying as long as we stay inquisitive and we keep looking at the data and trying to understand what could happen, what might happen. But don't let that paralyze us as we see that, but move forward. So, so we have that tough objective. We have to fly, and we have to fly safe. So we have to do both of those, and we can't do one or the other. We have to do both. And, and the teams have done a very good job of being able to balance that. Stefano? Yes, uh, Stefano Coledan for Italian uh, State Radio and Television. <coughs> Excuse me, for Mr. Gestenmeyer. Uh, what would it take for NASA to put uh, its own astronauts on capsules that are being privately uh, st studied or developed here in the United States, especially since I believe the astronauts have said that they would not fly on uh, non manned rated uh, rockets. We have a set of this before Orion, obviously. Yeah, we, we have a set of criteria that we've established uh, that we would go look at and, and evaluate. Um, again, I think an approach that we're following now is we. We have some commercial uh, resupply service contractors that are in place that are working on developing and launching cargo to space station and also will return some cargo from space station. I think those rockets will we'll gain experience with those. We'll see how well those rockets work. And then they might be the kind of the basis that you might then start thinking about moving into carrying crew on board. So, so we have a pretty formal process laid out that we would go through and review with the contractors before we would commit our crews to go fly on. We'll take uh, one more here and then come back. Uh, we'll go to Johnson Space Center and then come back here for follow-ups. Go ahead. Oh, my name is Yoshitomi from Mainichi Newspapers. Um, uh, Mr. Gustav Meyer, Japanese government has begun to consider to have its own manned space scheme, like exploring on the moon. Well, does this affect American space program? And what do you think about the Japan's bid to come into this field? Again, I think uh, my experience with the, the Japanese Space Agency has been extremely positive in space station. Uh, the fact that they're getting ready to go fly the new uh, HTV cargo transfer vehicle, in the fact they're going to do some uh, captive test firings at Tanegashima, I think, in the next month and, and the month after that, that's, that's tremendous, tremendous work. I think in space we really need to look at cooperation amongst nations and work together. 
and if the more countries that can contribute it can help and bring resources to the table the better it is for all of us so I think when we go back to the moon we want to do it jointly with international partners we want to use space station as kind of a proving ground of how we can put together those international relationships how we can uh, use hardware together to, to accomplish those goals and then move forward to the moon so I'm very supportive of, of those kind of activities I think it's it's the way of the future to work internationally and and to work as a team Okay, let's go to the Johnson Space Center for a question. Gina Sinceri, ABC News from Mike Leinbach. So how many more surprises do you think the shuttle has with 10 remaining missions? It seems like it still has the ability to surprise you, Mike. <laughs> um, surprise and, and delight. It, it, uh, this is a tremendous program to work in, work for. And, and uh, you know, the team tonight um, just performed excellently. Um, I promised everybody in the firing room that to get a picture of the of the launch because there's so many folks in the in the back of our firing room that can't see the the beautiful view that uh, Mike and I have and gurst out the windows. Um, how many surprises? Uh, you know, I don't know. It, it uh, uh, surprises are, are good. I'm I'm a guy that, that likes change. I'm a guy that likes challenges, um, but I also like a beautiful liftoff, and we got all that tonight. Okay, we're back here at Kennedy for a follow-up question. Todd? Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today for Bill Gerstenmeyer. Um, NASA got $400 million in the stimulus package that was uh, signed on February the 16th, and I'm wondering what options you're looking at for uh, uh, trying to minimize the gap with that $400 million, uh, what options you're considering whether you're considering doing an extra Aries test flight or what's out there to consider. Yeah, I think that that's really being looked at by the uh, Exploration Systems Mission Director more than, than my group. So I know they're looking at all those things. They're looking at trying to build a more robust schedule and try to, to, to ensure that Aries is ready to fly and Orion's ready to fly as early as possible. But as far as details, you'd probably have to ask them rather than myself. Hi, Clara Moskowitz for Space.com. Question for Mr. Ayashi. Can you tell us how much this mission is being followed by people in Japan and what Mr. Wakata's flight might mean to the Japanese people? Uh, if, if you don't mind, may, I may ask Rita uh, you are First of all, so many Japanese people are very, very um, happy and uh, um, uh, watching Mr. Uh, Wakata's flight, successful flight. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
モジュールの希望の最後の3つの最後の部分が打ち上がります、それを完成して帰ってくるということで、これも非常に日本の友人、宇宙技術の進展にとって意味があると考えています。And also,、uh, before Mr. Wakata comes back on the,、uh, the, uh, on the shuttle flight, that shuttle flight brings three parts, three final parts of the Japanese experiment module Kibo. So, in, that, in,、um, in other words,、uh, he will finish building up the Japanese experimental module Kibo. So, it is very, very meaningful、uh, for the Japanese、um, manned space program. Frank? Frank Mooring with Aviation Week, also from Mr. Hayashi. I understand that Japan is going to have a new space law, I believe, next month. And I wonder if you can tell us if that law will have a particular area of emphasis for Japan for the global exploration strategy, particularly on the moon, power, HAB, communications, that sort of thing. あの日本の,あの宇宙に関係する法律はあの実は去年、ベーシックロー、基本法という格好で成立いたしました。これはあの今まであの個別にあったあのいろんな計画を総理大臣が直轄して総理大臣のもとで直轄して計画を作るという趣旨を含めた法律です。Basic law. あのどうじゃなくてあの、いろんな計画を一つ。あ、excuse me、uh,。converge a lot of、uh, different programs into one,、uh, one program under the、uh, leadership of prime minister。で、あのそのもとに担当大臣が置かれまして、その担当大臣が現在、今後10年程度の長期的なプログラムを作成中です。We appointed、uh, the new,、uh, new minister for that purpose, and this minister is now、uh, planning to establish a program in the in,、uh, 10 years program. でこれによりまして、特にあの日本で従来、少し遅れておると言われました、例えば産業、宇宙の産業利用、あるいはその、有人技術、そういったものを含めて、これから日本がどうしていくかということを今、議論している途中でございます。この新しいプログラムはあの今年の夏にはあ出来上がるというふうに考えております。John Ellis, Tokyo Broadcasting System. This is a question for Mr. g r i s t e n m e y e r and Mr. Hayashi.、Uh, recently, we've seen collisions in space increasing. Uh, orbital debris.、And、I just wonder how that has reprioritized NASA's and JAXA's and other international organizations'、uh, policies and objectives in terms of removing that debris and, and getting in or converging your own communication about that debris、uh, amongst yourselves.
We actively track uh, the debris, or we have the act actually the Air Force tracks the debris for us, and then they provide us with the information, and then we do the calculations about how close our, our assets like space station or or other spacecraft, NASA spacecraft, could be to the debris. And then if there's a, a collision and avoidance maneuver, we have a detailed set of flight rules. So those really haven't changed uh, from, from the beginning, so they're the same basic process that we continue to use. And, and in fact, I think we're even tracking a piece now that, that's potentially going to come close to space station that we may end up doing something with here as the shuttle approaches. So we've already coordinated that with folks and we've, we've tracked things. I think it's it's getting more attention in the media recently because of the the recent collision than it than it has in the past. But it's always been a serious consideration for us and something that we really need to watch out for. In terms of our own rocket design, we're careful that if we can design a like the second stage or other pieces of this, the rocket as it goes to orbit, so it doesn't become debris. We're going to try to do that in the future, and we've been doing that all along to try to minimize the source of the debris to begin with. So, so I think we're we're aware of it on both sides. I, I think that there's more attention to it now than there's been in the past, but it's always been a consideration that we really need to watch. And, and we'll, we share information back and forth. Uh, I know in one of the science experiments, uh, is a Japanese science experiment that we are using jointly with them. We provide information to them about collision potentials with that particular device. Um, for this kind of pro problem, the international coordination is very important, I think. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
sure, make sure that we don't get so focused on the, the crew transportation piece, we miss the criticality of the cargo piece, and we need to make sure that cargo piece is there to keep station functional and operational, or there's no need to take crew to and from station. Yeah. Uh, my name is Hajime Tobe uh, with Kyodo News. Uh, for Mr. Garsten Meyer, uh, you have uh, uh, the new administration, I mean, uh, President Obama. So, uh, uh, could you tell me the current situation of the discussion on the use of the ISS after 2015? We're beginning to have some discussions with the administration now about continuing to use the space station. Um, I think we can we can show that the space station can provide a tremendous uh, asset uh, to the to the to the U.S. Um, it also aligns very well with many of the uh, objectives that the, the new administration has, has brought forward. I think space station can be used as an effective tool to, f to foster education. I think it can be used as a tool to push research further forward. It can be clearly used uh, in the fields of health care, those kind of items. We're looking at some salmonella vaccine that we've been working on board with space station. We also have been looking at some, uh, some of the diseases or problems that our astronauts face are, are problems similar to what the elderly face, uh, the bone loss uh, situation, some of the, uh, the momentary uh, disorientation the crews have when they return are similar. So I think we can utilize the uniqueness of space to solve some of the problems here on Earth. So I think we're starting to have discussions with the new administration about how the space station can be utilized to solve, to, to solve or at least address some of the issues and concerns that they would like us to go do, f to do forward. So, so we're just beginning those discussions with them now about continuing to utilize the space station. We're trying to show how it provides real benefit, real tangible benefit to, to the U.S. and to the new administration. Todd. Uh, Todd Halverson of Florida today again, one for Gerst and, and one for Mike Leinbach. Um, for Gerst, um, I'm wondering what you know about uh, the search for a new NASA administrator and when you expect to uh, hear a decision and who you personally would nominate if uh, you had the choice. And for uh, Mike Leinbach, um, I just wondered if you could give us a sense of how things are looking for the uh, Hubble Space Telescope mission in May. Well, to your first question, I'd, even though I live in Washington, I'm a little more focused on the tactical side than the, the strategic side, so I don't really know much about the plans for a new administrator or where we're, we're heading. And, and in terms of a vote, uh, my, my vote doesn't count, so I won't even <laughs> bother you with, with, my, uh, with my opinion. So. As long as it's not you, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, as Mike <laughs> said, as long as it's not me, it's okay. <laughs> uh, the processing for Hubble is going fine. We're going we're gonna to roll out of the OPF on the 23rd of this month and then out to the pad a week later. So we're right on, we're right on track with that, with that orbiter. Okay, I think we're going to call it a wrap. Thank you all for coming. We'll get back to live mission coverage. A reminder that NASA television will carry the STS-119 mission around the clock through the planned landing on March 28. And as always, you can follow the activities of the shuttle mission at www.nasa.gov shuttle. Thank you again for coming. Zambo, Discovery copies, go for orbit ops. Thank you. This is Mission Control Houston, now back inside the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room. The team here in Mission Control has been monitoring Discovery's systems as the crew on board has been setting up for the on-orbit operations. And the mid and the forward off. 
And when that's done, block 18 will be complete. Discovery Houston, we concur with your plan for block 18. Mission Control gave the crew on board Discovery the go for orbit ops or operations at 8.21 uh, p.m. Central Time following the opening of Discovery's payload bay doors that occurred at 8.17 p.m. Central Time. Discovery Houston, go ahead. Hey, with that door is open now, hopefully that uh, worked out with that, though, with your uh, video coverage. And uh, if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind just getting a little tag up with you. I'm going to read down what I think where we're at and then uh, see if you guys concur. At Discovery, we did get great video of those uh, payload bay doors opening. Thank you for uh, getting it so we could see that. And uh, we're ready to, uh, to copy what you think you've got done, and we'll square it up with what we have. Okay, starting from the top on uh, page 1-3, I do believe we've got everything on that page complete. And then uh, block 18 complete, I see uh, everything on 1-5 complete as well. Going over to 1-7. Uh, we've got the uh, UHM mode off. Uh, you did give us the go for orbit ops, and we're down to the uh, KU band antenna deploy and activation. And I think that's Drew, thanks for your uh, assessment, and we concur with uh, with what you see up there. Okay, are you ready for the uh, KU deploying activation? Discovery, we're ready for KU band antenna deploy and uh, antenna activation. Sounds great. Well, uh, Joel, uh, jump on that in a few minutes, and uh, he'll let you know as soon as he gets on it. We copy.
This is Mission Control Houston, now one hour and 43 minutes into the flight of the Space Shuttle Discovery. The crew on board continuing to work through procedures to set up for the on-orbit uh, mission. With the team here in Mission Control following along. The next uh, steps will be to uh, deploy the KU band antenna, the uh, dish on board the space shuttle that allows the downlink of high uh, rate uh, data and video. The timing of the payload bay door opening did coincide with the communications with the uh, engineering communication uh, center uh, located here at uh, Johnson Space Center. So video was shown to Mish Control as that occurred and we'll work to replay that here on NASA television since that occurred at uh, 8.17 p.m. Central Time during the post-launch news conference. Discovery has completed one orbit of the Earth, uh, flying over the Atlantic Ocean again after its uh, liftoff from the Kennedy Space Center an hour and 45 minutes ago. Houston Discovery, KU band antenna deploy is in work and I will be doing this by myself. Discovery, Houston, we copy KU antenna deploy and uh, we'll be watching you.
The crew on board the space shuttle Discovery is working through the procedure to deploy the KU band antenna. Other items on tap include uh, stowing all the the uh, launch uh, suits that the crew members wore for uh, Discovery's liftoff. Now uh, on orbit, the crew members can uh, wear their shirt sleeve uh, clothes without uh, the orange launch and entry suits. The crew members will also work on removing the seats that were set up on the mid-deck for three of the crew members and stow those. The uh, crew members will activate the star tracker and open the uh, door for that to monitor stars and help or assist the guidance and navigation uh, control system. Houston Discovery, KU Band antenna deploy is complete and KU Band activation is in work. Discovery Houston, a great job, Joe. We saw a nominal KU Band antenna deploy and we will watch you for KU Band antenna activation. Thanks, Zambo. Mission Specialist Joe Acaba reporting that the KU band antenna is uh, deployed. He's coordinating uh, with astronaut George Zamka here in Mission Control, who has served as the CAPCOM or capsule communicator during uh, Discovery's ascent and initial on orbit operations. The ascent team here in Mission Control is handing over to the next shift of flight controllers, the Orbit 2 team. Orbit 2 team will follow along with the procedures to continue getting Discovery ready for the 13-day uh, mission in space. Other major activities for uh, configuring the vehicle include checking out the re remote manipulator system or the Space Shuttle's Canada arm, its robotic arm. The arm will first be used on flight day two for a checkout of Discovery's heat shield.
Discovery Houston, when you're ready, I have the post ascent imagery quick look report for the crew. Hey, Zambo, we'll go right ahead with that. Brew, the video and film screening is just getting underway, but so far there are no observations indicating any concern for the vehicle or a success of the mission. That's great news, Emma. Thank you very much. Hey, Brew, if uh, someone's available, we'd like to collect a window report from you. Zamo, yep, uh, it's uh, it's dark right now, but we uh, when our last day passed, we noticed a l uh, both were a little bit hazy, but uh, in overall fine shape. Copy uh, both front windows a little bit hazy, but no uh, no other details, and both in fine shape. Uh, that that was the best of our recollection. I'll take a look uh, during our next day pass, but that's what I recall and, uh, from uh, last time we took a peek. Okay, Bruce, we copy those words. Thanks very much. Astronaut George Zamka here in Mission Control speaking with Discovery's Commander Lee Archambault on board. Uh, he's giving a report of the how uh, Discovery's windows looked the last time the space shuttle was passing through daylight. Standard uh, procedure to provide a cruise insight or observations down to Mission Control and experts here on the ground. Uh, that uh, following Zamka's report, that initial uh, quick look of uh, the launch video has not uh, shown any issues. Houston for KU Band activation. I'm uh, down halfway down the page on page 2 3. Uh, Digi did select the L as, and I'm reading for elevation 001.2 and for azimuth 000.5. Swanee, Inco copies those numbers, and those are great values. Okay, continuing on. Mission Specialist Steve Swanson working through the procedure to activate the KU band antenna after it uh, was previously deployed. Houston Discovery for uh, GNC, Star Tracker activation and door opening. Block 12 and work. Okay, Discovery, we copy block 12 in work. And Houston Discovery, the self test for KU Vans coming in work. Why don't we copy the self-twist uh, is in work and Inco copies. I'm used to discovery from the mid-deck uh, block 13. That's escape pole is complete. Okay, John, copy block 13 complete. Thank you. All the crew members on board Discovery pitching in to help with the post-insertion uh, checklist, going through the items step by step. Uh, one of those being the star tracker activation and the door opening to assist with Discovery's uh, guidance and navigation control system. Also stowing the escape pole inside Discovery's cabin.